Hi y'all. If you'll recall from yesterday, I did a video response to a video done by Ashley Mardell. Her video was titled Handy Feminists. And in there I briefly discussed what most people's relationship with logic. One of the, one common thing that appears and particularly in, on the internet, not so much in real life, is that a person thinks that if I just uh, say that there's some logical fallacy, my work here is done, I've I've struck a blow to my opponent's argument, rah rah rah, three backs full. This um, comes from the lack of education people have about logic. For example, these people who like to go around shouting argumentum ad hominem, or did they just say ad hominem, they don't even say argumentum ad hominem. They don't have any understanding generally of the distinction between a formal fallacy and an informal fallacy, which is to say a fallacy and something that may or may not be fallacious. That's uh, the nature of an informal fallacy, is that it could still be true. So you could have an ad hominem that is not fallacious. So I'll give you an example. This comes up, uh, it, well, it comes up with all credentialing processes, like your medical doctor, your certified mechanics, or whatever. The certification gives you some reason to be somewhat confident that the person has passed uh, some skills test that means you should be able to generally trust them, but you have shitty doctors, you have malpractice, uh, you have mechanics who forget to put the lug nuts back on and your wheel falls off. So the presence of a certificate does not guarantee the competence of the person who possesses it. It's just a reason for you to be somewhat comfortable that the person generally knows what they're doing, hopefully. Uh, and the absence of it, by the way, does not mean that the person doesn't know what they're talking about. So it's not one of logic there, it's, it's one of persuasion. It's to convince you that there's some reason to suppose that this thing is or isn't uh, one state of affairs or another. No one would think that it's dubious to say, to use an ad hominem attack against a person who's wanting to open a daycare if you learn that he's been twice convicted for selling children into sex slavery. Uh, that is an ad hominem. It's against the person's character, but it's not fallacious because the trait being teased out about the person's character is directly relevant to the subject matter being discussed, namely whether or not one's children will be safe at a daycare run by a professional pedophile, or maybe even an amateur one. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to grade them, but either way, uh, not not the best bet. In the same way that getting tax advice from Kent Hovind is probably unwise, considering he's been convicted for tax fraud. Probably not the guy you want to go to, even if he manages to get a certificate somehow or other. the The test there on these informal fallacies is about is about. Uh, well, in the ad hominem uh, arena, is about whether or not what's being addressed is related about the person, the, the trait being teased out, is related to the subject matter being discussed. If the two are related, it's not fallacious to uh, use the person's character to impugn their argument. Because here, with, with informal fallacies, you're talking about the persuasive force of the argument, not its logical structure. Whereas in the formal context, you're talking exclusively about the formal structure. Uh, as I mentioned in my video to Ashley Mardell, uh, logical arguments, to, to the, the formal aspect of it, it says true. It, you set up a structure so that true, so that way true premises guarantee true conclusions. It does not guarantee that you will get always true premises. You sometimes get false premises, but uh, it's a structure. It, uh, logical validity deals with form, and, lo and soundness deals with whether or not the premises in an argument are actually true, not whether or not they logically follow from each other, whether or not there's entailment. There are three types of logical arguments in a general sense. You have deductive arguments, inductive arguments, and abductive arguments. Logic, uh, you know, it, it, um, when you really want to talk, drill down into formal logic, you're talking about deductive arguments. And then in statistics and you know, the empirical uh, sciences and other things, you're talking about inductive arguments. Whereas in normal everyday conversation, you're typically talking about abductive arguments. People are making guesses about what else would be true, which would you know satisfy some conditions or other that they've been given. Whereas inductive arguments, you know, it's what's the likelihood? Uh, how confident are we that this conclusion is true? And in deductive arguments, it is it's one of necessity. Does the does the conclusion we're met here with fall uh, direct follow, uh, follow directly from the premises? That is to say, is it entailed by the premises? So let's talk about buying a car or buying a house, and uh, you know the 
little blurb that you always see at the end of, or hear at the end of these commercials is something like, uh, low interest rates on approved credit. The argument there is that if you have good credit, you get a lower rate. From which people infer, quite readily and quite properly, in an ordinary sense, if you have shitty credit, you don't get the good interest rate. There's a Latin phrase for this kind of inference. Uh, to, it, it's uh, expressio unius est exclusio al alterius. The express mention of the one excludes all the others. So the express mention of, the, of this condition, namely good credit, excludes all the other states of affairs for your credit uh, in order to get the, the, the goodie bag at the end of the rainbow, which is the lower interest rate. As you may have noticed, for the astute among you, I have a truth table here, and we're going to use that to evaluate, um, in a logical sense, the argument, if good credit, then low interest rate. All right, so um, in my videos, I, I do make sure that my arguments are logically valid, though I don't spend a lot of time talking about jargon. In this video, there's going to be a little bit of jargon. Sorry about it, but you need to know the pieces. So P represents something called the antecedent, and Q represents something called the consequent. So uh, P implies Q is the argument. If good, uh, if good credit, then low interest rate. And uh, as you can see, um, you have two states of affairs with respect to P. Uh, well, yeah, two states of affairs. It can either be true or false. Same with Q, it can either be true or false. And then because you have two of these, uh, you can have the state of affairs where you have P be true and Q be true, or P be true and Q be false. And then on the false bit, P can be false and Q can be true, P can be false and Q can be false. And then you have the actual proposition you've been given, which is P implies Q. And then you assume, uh, well, as you can see here, it's true three ways and false only one way. Another way to think about this is that it's true everywhere you have it be the case that it's not P or it's Q. So if P is false, you get true. So here, P is false, you get out true. It doesn't matter what Q is doing. And then, uh, in, this dis in that disjunction, the other place you need to look for is wherever Q is true, you also uh, get it true. So this is false only where Q is false and, uh, and not P is false, which is to say P is true. Okay, so if good credit, then low interest rate. Uh, and then, so you have some, some okay, uh, backing up here for a second. A lot of people have heard of, um, all, men are, uh, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. It's a pretty standard example. So another way to put that in a conditional, like this, P implies Q, would be that if, if someone is a man, then he is mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. So here, um, we, we have if good credit, then low interest. So somebody comes in and we say X is a P or whatever, so I'll just write that here as P. And then you will draw the conclusion, therefore, Q. So if good credit, then low interest. Has good credit, therefore, gets low interest. Now, in ordinary language, you can draw the following inference doesn't have good credit, which is to say bad credit, therefore doesn't get the low interest rate. <clears throat> so not P, therefore not Q. Absolutely ordinary, this is the negative implication. Uh, ordinary to be drawn in regular conversation, absolutely impermissible on logic. Let's go back to our truth table here. Where are the places where P are false? Here and here. Well, as you can see, if Q is false, this could still be true, and if Q is true, that could still be true. So it's true in either case. These two um, parts right here run into an area where you get something called vacuous truths, where the statement is true uh, just by dint of how what's called a material implication operates. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, the, this is true everywhere where it's either not P or it's Q. That's just how it's defined. So you could have it be the case that you could give a false antecedent. The antecedent, uh, whatever's the proposition there uh, in the antecedent is false, and nevertheless the whole proposition remains true. Because it doesn't matter what Q does. Now this, uh, this line up here, 
for those who have taken a logic class, is, is, um, is what's called modus ponens, where you're given the proposition, you're, whatever the state of affairs is, P implies Q, you assume that it's true, and that's what you're looking for, and then you're told P is true, so you look for where P is true, and then you draw an inf you, you just, you know, oh, that's what must be true, Q. This is, uh, this is modus tollens, so we're told P implies Q, and then you're told not Q, and then you look and go, ah, oh, then it must therefore be the case, not P. Now, the inference that, that you draw here where you get the not P, uh, and therefore not Q in normal language, actually commits a structural logical problem in, in well, in logic, and it's called denying the antecedent. Just because you say, you say that uh, P is false does not imply that the proposition <laughs> is therefore false. Indeed, as you can see, it can still be true. So, you cannot draw the inference from knowing that the antecedent is false, that the argument is false. In order to uh, have this where you deny something, and then you can draw a conclusion about the other part of the argument, it would have to be the modus tollens, as I talked about. So, here, instead of um, you, uh, not P, therefore not Q, it would be not Q, therefore not P. Um, <clears throat> So that's the distinction between normal language and what you can do there and logic, what you can and can't do there. If I told you that you could have a false antecedent, a false you know, beginning to an argument <laughs> and still nevertheless have a true argument, a logically true argument, most people would say, not digging it, it doesn't jive with me, it's counterintuitive, I ain't buying it, you're full of shit, and it would be exactly true. As I mentioned, you have something called a vacuous truth. It's vacuous in the sense that it's logically true, but absolutely meaningless. Um, there's a good article, uh, a decent article about this on Wikipedia, and I think it's something like um, you can walk into a room where there are no cell phones and say, all of the cell phones in this room are turned on, and that is a logically true statement because the antecedent is false. It doesn't matter what's happening after that because that original state of affairs is false, Anything that comes after it is consistent with its being false. It doesn't matter. So uh, there's that. And then there is uh, another way that you can say something that's logically true that people are going to be like, I'm actually, there are other, many other ways, but uh, I'll talk about another one here. And people are going to be like, no, that's actually not true when it is in reality true. And this is, a, this is an expression I use a lot. It's a fortiori. So if I tell you that cats are two-legged animals, most people can be like, no, they're four-legged animals. Well, yes, they are four-legged animals. That proposition is true, but because that proposition is true, it's also necessarily true that they're two-legged animals, because you can't have an animal with four legs that doesn't also have two legs. And so uh, it follows as the night does the day that if it is a four-legged animal, it must also be a two-legged animal. And a one-legged animal and a three-legged animal. Some particular state of affairs in the world will entail certain other states of affairs in the world. And you can state those other states of affairs um, even more strongly than you can state the original. That's what a fortiori means. Even better reason to, to know. Even better reason to suppose. You can state those other states of affairs with even more confidence than the original one. Like, for example, you might be off by one leg on a, I don't know, say a cat. Maybe it has five, maybe it has three. But if I say it's two-legged, and uh, you know, in reality it's only three or four, it's only three or maybe it, it is four, then there's an even better reason, or at least uh, as strong of a reason to suppose that it's two-legged as there is to suppose that it is four-legged. So I'm on even better footing by underselling the argument a little bit. Uh, which is, I got a kick out of this because about a year and a half, two years ago, something like that maybe, there was a, an article making the rounds about how ISIS fighters are afraid of being killed by women which is true. They're not any more afraid of being killed by women than they are of being killed by men, but that's the inference people are going to draw, that there's something particularly special about being killed by a woman that really makes the ISIS people uh, run away. Really, you know, uh, oh, God, no, it really scares them. And it, well, in the article, it actually said that. And then uh, people were, you know, they were debunking the claim that ISIS is afraid of being killed by women. And so when I talk to these people, I'll be like, are you saying that, 
that they're not afraid to be killed by women? They're like, well, no, of course they're afraid to be killed by women. But it's false to say that they're afraid to be killed by women. It's like, no, it's true. <laughs> it's a fortiori true. They're, they're just afraid to be killed. <laughs> anyway, you can have a lot of fun with logic, particularly in the, uh, when, when, they, uh, when it meshes with ordinary language. And this is one of the ways, by the way, that lawyers lie to juries in court, because they're not lying. They are saying true things that are wholly misleading. Uh, politicians do it all the time. It's very easy to do. Uh, as I mentioned, I used to work in law enforcement. It's very easy to only ever say true things to people and get them to believe entirely false propositions. All you have to do is understand logic and how that differs from ordinary language and the fact that most people don't understand logic all that well. And so you can say things that are true, like cats are two-legged animals, that <laughs> people are going to disagree with you vehemently about. And nevertheless, it's true, and, uh, and you can get them to believe false things. Another way to get people to believe false things, you may not believe this, but it's true, you can just lie to them. Uh, the lie I'm proudest of having told in my life was when I, the youngest was about four or five, she wanted a pet cow. <laughs> We moved out here, and she saw a cow, and she's like, oh, I want one of those. And I said, uh, well, we can't get you a pet cow, because if, if you forget to take care of your cow, if you forget to milk the cow every day, they blow up. <laughs> and so she, she thought for a while, it took me a little bit of convincing here to, to get her to believe that cows would explode if not milked. But uh, I used as an example those uh, couches that have, like, cow patterns. I'm like, how do you think that happened? Cow blew up. Anyway. So that's one way you could do it, but in other ways you can be slightly clever and say only true things like cats are two-legged animals and you, you could, uh, well, that one's going to be a little bit difficult to do. But things like that to get people to believe false propositions by only ever saying true things. And uh, this is one of the problems that I averred, uh, I re referred to in my, er, my other video to Ashley Mardell. The people on that side of the argument, on you know, the feminist side, um, don't understand logic, but they are persuaded that they do know what they're talking about. And they go around saying lots and lots of stupid shit that's logically false that they believe to be true. And it's hysterical because in response to that you can say things that you know they're going to disagree with that are logically true just to watch how stupid they actually are. Alright, have a great day.